Hello, um, here we are going to zoom in on uh, four of these uh, specific uh, conditions, atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, and heart failure. So we'll begin by uh, talking about atherosclerosis. As always, the definition is a good place to start. So this is a degenerative and an inflammatory disease that affects medium and large vessels. By vessels here, we are referring primarily to arteries. So medium and large arteries. And this results in thickening of the vessel wall as well as reduced elasticity. So the pathogenesis of this is some form of endothelial injury or susceptibility to injury, for example, in hypertension or in hyperlipidemia. And this allows for lipid accumulation within the intima, which is the innermost layer of the vessel wall. And together with this, there is a cellular reaction comprising smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, inflammatory cells, foam cells, as well as the deposition of extracellular matrix. So here I am drawing a vessel for you, and um, this would be the lumen. In atherosclerosis, the lumen is often very much narrowed because of the deposition of this lipid-rich material and the cellular reaction. So we have the lipid-rich material here in the intima, and the intima is markedly thickened, and then we have the cellular reaction and um, on histology, we would see that there are lots of cholesterol clefts in this, in this lipid-rich area together with foam cells with a more cellular proliferation um, over it, which is a fibrous cap. So the lumen is often narrowed, and this results, of course, in decreased uh, blood flow going to the organ that is being supplied which of course means that there is ischemia in that organ. And this, if it's a very vital organ, such as the heart and the brain, this can have uh, very severe consequences. The heart, essentially, there will be ischemic heart disease, which we'll talk about next. In the lower limbs, uh, sometimes the vessels supplying the lower limbs can also be narrowed, or there can be thromboembolic phenomenon from um, reaction to this plaque. And this can give rise to severe pain when walking as well. Now, what else can happen to the plaque? Um, sometimes the plaque can ulcerate or it can rupture, and this is called acute plaque change. And when this happens, there is direct injury to the endothelial cells. And if you recall, this is part of Virchow's triad, and this would precipitate the formation of a thrombus. So in an already narrowed uh, vessel, the danger is that the thrombus can be occlusive and can block up the lumen. And there can be resulting thromboembolism. So if the vessel is not completely blocked up, for example, if it's a large vessel like the aorta, this can actually throw off emboli to any of the distal smaller vessels and can in turn occlude them. Or if the vessel is a more medium-sized vessel, such as the coronary artery, uh, there can be complete occlusion of the vas uh, vascular lumen. And when that happens, of course, uh, there is this uh, danger of infarction or ischemic necrosis of the tissue that is being supplied. And again, if it is important, like the heart or brain, then um, this can result in even a mortality. Now, another effect that it can have on the vessel wall is this dilatation of the wall due to weakening and loss of elasticity. And this is called an aneurysm. Aneurysm, aneurysmal change, aneurysm formation. And again, with an aneurysm, there is loss of the lamina flow, some turbulence, which can give rise to thromboemboli. And the aneurysm itself may rupture, giving rise to hemorrhage. If it is in a very large vessel, you can imagine like the aorta, this uh, hemorrhage can be catastrophic and can lead rapidly to mortality. Now let's move on and talk about ischemic heart disease. Now for ischemic heart disease, um, again we begin with the definition and uh, this is a spectrum of conditions that is uh, characterized by imbalance between the supply and demand for oxygenated blood to the myocardium. So this is also defined in your lecture, slightly with a different wording. As a spectrum of disorders, due to the imbalance between myocardial metabolic demands and coronary blood flow. Now, a majority of cases of ischemic heart disease are due to coronary artery disease. In other words, atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries, because these are the arteries that supply the myocardium. And um, again, this is the cause in more than 90% of cases. 
There are four main clinical manifestations of ischemic heart disease. One of them is angina pectoris, and uh, this has a very specific definition. It is chest pain, which is episodic, which means that it is brought on by exercise and it is relieved by rest. And there can be two main clinical types of angina, which is stable versus unstable. So unstable angina occurs when, um, if you recall, you have an atheromatous plaque and there is ulceration or acute plaque change and perhaps the beginning of uh, thrombus formation. And this is an important clinical uh, sign to recognize or rather clinical symptom to recognize because it may herald uh, impending myocardial infarction. So learn how to recognize this clinically and you can see um, get more information from your textbooks as well as your lecture notes on this. The second entity is myocardial infarction, which essentially uh, is translated in layman's terms as heart attack. And this is when there is ischemic necrosis of the myocardium due to reduced perfusion. Myocardial infarction can be non-full thickness, uh, which we call subendocardial infarction, often due to systemic hypoperfusion, uh, or it could be transmural or full thickness. So usually myocardial infarction happens when there is a pre-existing uh, atheromatous plaque in the coronary arteries which then ruptures and gives rise to thrombosis um, causing occlusion of the vessel. Now there are some complications of myocardial infarction which we will briefly mention over here. One of them is ventricular fibrillation or VF. This is a very severe arrhythmia which is not compatible with life unless the patient is immediately defibrillated. Uh, often these patients will die on the spot. There can also be rupture and leading to cardiac tamponade which we briefly talked about under pericardial conditions, uh, rupture of the necrotic myocardium. There can also be left ventricular failure. This is, of course, assuming the infarction is in the left ventricle. Uh, aneurysm formation uh, after some time when there is healing and weakening of the ventricular wall. There can also be thrombus formation and resulting embolism in the area of wall that is abnormal because it does not pump in coordination with the rest of the myocardium. And there can be valvular insufficiency. This is usually due to uh, necrosis of the papillary muscle, which is anchoring the valve leaflets, giving rise to regurgitation. And yet another complication, <coughs> this usually occurs a few days after the myocardial infarction, is uh, pericarditis. So this is why patients must be monitored and also checked for chest pain of a different nature post-myocardial infarction. Now, the next clinical entity would be sudden cardiac death within the spectrum of ischemic heart disease. And this is usually secondary to arrhythmia, which we mentioned already here, ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation can occur not only uh, when there is myocardial infarction, but also in the absence of infarction, whenever there is uh, acute plaque change or when there is severe significant stenosis in the coronary arteries. And the last entity uh, among the four is chronic ischemic heart disease, which is characterized by slow progressive loss of the myofibers in the heart or the heart muscle leading to heart failure. So just a very quick look at the risk factors for atherosclerosis and ischemic heart disease. As you can imagine, there is a significant overlap because after all, the number one cause of ischemic heart disease is coronary artery atherosclerosis. So the simplest way to approach this is to look at non-modifiable risk factors versus modifiable risk factors that can be treated um, by lifestyle changes or medication. So under non-modifiable, we have age, of course, a higher age group, middle aged to elderly has a higher risk. Males or post-menopausal women also have a higher risk. Um, patients with a family history of ischemic heart disease, as well as those who may be genetically predisposed, for example, to hyperlipidemia, are also at increased risk. Now, when it comes to modifiable risk factors, there are quite a number, and hypertension is one of them, uh, which is what we're going to talk about next. Hypertension uh, kind of predisposes the vessels to uh, lipid accumulation and atheroma formation. Of course, increased lipidemia, hyperlipidemia, um, diabetes mellitus, which all of these conditions can be controlled to a certain extent with medication. And we have lifestyle factors such as smoking, um, obesity, as well as sedentary lifestyle. 
For ischemic heart disease, there are also other risk factors in addition to these. Because if you remember, uh, the definition is that there is an imbalance between the demand and the supply. So there are some conditions which result in either increased oxygen demand or decreased oxygen uh, supply in the blood. And for increased demand, we have an example such as hyperthyroidism, hormonal uh, changes or abnormalities. And for decreased uh, oxygenation, oxygen carrying capacity in the blood, there are many conditions, some of which I've written here, anemia, carbon monoxide poisoning, or even patients with chronic long-standing lung disease, which affects gas exchange. In the next mind map, we will talk about hypertension and heart failure.